Well, today we're going to talk about, I think, what is one of the most important subjects that we've ever addressed. And I say that because this one subject will affect how you understand all of the other subjects. Now, I know that many people were raised in an environment where they were told that it was the job of theologians or clergy to explain the scriptures. And the laity, or the people who were in the pews, were essentially just supposed to listen and take it in. But I'm going to suggest to you today that if you read scripture, and I think everyone who listens to this presentation would say, yes, I read scripture. Maybe not every day, maybe not as often as I should, but I do read scripture. If you read scripture, then the question is not, should you interpret scripture? Because you are interpreting scripture. It's not, can you do it? Should you do it? Because you do interpret the word of God every time you open up that book. The question is whether or not you interpret it well or whether you interpret it poorly. And the purpose of the series that I'm starting tonight is to help you to interpret scripture well. At the end of our last session, one of the members of our group brought up a scripture that had been taught to him just that very morning at church for the purpose of contradicting what I had been teaching. And so I said, well, let's go take a look at it. I pulled it up on the screen. And so I spent about five minutes going through and giving the reasons why I believe the interpretation he had been given of his scripture was incorrect. And after he said, well, just with exasperation, he said, well, how am I supposed to know that? In other words, I'm giving you a scripture from the word of God. I'm telling you what it says. And now you're telling me it doesn't mean what it seems to mean. Well, how am I supposed to make sense of this? And the answer is what I'm going to be sharing with you in tonight's series. Every Christian needs to be taught to be able to interpret Scripture, because you're going to interpret Scripture anyway, you might as well do it to the best of your ability. Now, this is not something that you can do without being taught. And as my friend, who was exasperated the other day, indicated, if you haven't been taught these things, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how much time you spend reading the Bible you're simply going to be reinforcing the same wrong ideas. What you need is to be taught the life skills that are necessary for you to interpret the scripture well for yourself. Now, this is not intended as a replacement for clergy or books or videos or this program. There's still a very much a place for those who are called by God to share the meaning of the word in a way that might not be obvious. And so there still is room for those who teach, those who exposit, but how much better for you to be able to make sense of the word of God without the assistance of someone who might not be there when you're reading it. So let's talk about the word of God. The word is very different than everything else. There's really nothing else I can compare it to. Jesus says of the word that he is the living word. He is the word of God. And that all scripture is of God. In other words, even though people wrote the Bible, and there are many authors of the books of the Bible, there really is one ultimate author, and that is God. And I'll be sharing with you a scripture that shows this from the New Testament in just a moment. But I want to start with looking at the uh, Old Testament scriptures, and I've got several of them up on the screen here. And we see this is uh, right after the death of Moses, the very first chapter in Joshua as he's leading the new Jewish nation. And the, the lawgiver, Moses, is now dead, and there's a new guy who millions of Jews now were expected to follow. And so what does God tell him? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, 
but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So God is telling Joshua, even though you are already my anointed leader, I've told everyone, you are the leader of the Jewish nation. You still have to focus on my law that I conveyed through your predecessor, Moses, day and night. Now, this is not, I think, to be taken literally, because it says the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So literally, that would mean that you'd never stop speaking the words of the Bible. I think the intent of this passage very clearly is, Joshua, just because you were my anointed, doesn't mean that you're going to be a good leader. You must remain in my word. You must be led by what I have taught my people if you're going to be a successful leader. Later on, David in Psalm 119 writes, I have stored up, or another translation, it says, hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you're going to have a relationship with God, what does a relationship with him mean? Well, relationship means an exchange, a connection between two people or two beings in this case, because one is a divine being, one is a human being. But to please God, to honor God, to have the relationship with God that we're called to have, you have to know him. You have to understand what it is that he wants. How are you going to know God to do this? Well, the only way for you to know for sure what God wants you to know about him is to read the Bible. It's the only opportunity that you have to get it directly from God. As much care as I try to put into my messages, I'm fallible. I could add something or take something away when I present things to you in the way that I do. God's word is perfect. Now, human interpretation is often far from perfect, but the word itself is perfection because it is divine. And so this is the opportunity that you have to get to know God in the way that he commands us, not merely asks us, but that he commands us to know him. Because otherwise, there is no basis for the relationship. This is the objective foundation of everything that you believe. If what you believe in a subject is not founded, is not rooted on Scripture, it doesn't belong there. Because there have long been teachings of men. As long as there have been men, there have been things that men make up. Don't equate those things to the Word of God. They're not in the same category. That's not to say that there can't be uh, a pithy maxim or a parable that has some value to it. Of course, there can be sayings, a stitch in time saves nine. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not divine in its origin. Finally, in Proverbs 3, we see the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, saying, your word, or in the translation that I'm used to hearing this, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So what Solomon is saying is, you, your word directs me step by step through everything in my life. It is your word that is my guide. So understanding what the word of God says is incredibly important. Now, when you're studying the word of God, it is very possible that some of you may be memorizing scripture. And I think this is wonderful. I recommend it. Uh, it takes energy, it takes effort. And candidly, we don't do it because all of us are to some degree lazy. Now, there might be someone watching you who has an eidetic memory. And what I'm about to say won't apply to you because you can perfectly recall every word that you say because there's a photo of it in your mind's eye. Well, but for the rest of us, when we read a passage of scripture, we are not leaving that interaction with the scripture. We are leaving with our interpretation of what we read. So in other words, let's say you read a chapter in the Bible. There are all these thoughts that are going to filter through your mind. 
in the entire universe, there is no one else who would have exactly that same thought progression that you will. You are a unique individual. You will see it from a unique perspective, which is based on your upbringing, the things that you've heard, the things that you've experienced in your life, your temperament, all the things that make you an individual. God understands that. And there is necessarily a subjective element that comes into it because God's word is being filtered through you. But you're starting out with something that is objectively true. And then what your takeaway is, is it's filtered through your subjective way of thinking about it. So when we study scripture, we need to recognize that we're not going to be perfect unless we take the time to actually memorize the scripture. We're not going to be perfect in our recollection of what the scripture says. We're going to come away with an impression. And we want to do everything in our power to make that impression as correct as possible. Well, I've been looking at the Old Testament to start because I like to do things in some type of order. Now I would like to switch to the New Testament. And uh, this next passage is, I think, the clearest description of the importance of Scripture and the life of a believer. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And it goes on in the next verse to say that the man of God might be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, what do these words mean? All scripture is inspired by God. Another way of saying that is God breathed. If you look in various translations, you'll say it is coming right from the very breath of God, even though he used human hands. All scripture is actually authored by God. Now, one of the things that's very hard for people to understand about the Bible is why it is the way it is. Let's say that Jenny were inspired by the many birds that come to visit us at Palladia. And she decides, I'm going to learn about birds. So one day she goes over to the library and she checks out a book on birds. She's looking through the table of contents, and I've never seen this book because I'm just making it up here, but I'll tell you what the book is going to say. Chapter one, why study birds? Chapter two, what is a bird? Chapter three, the attributes of birds. Chapter four, the life cycle of birds. And it's going to go on in a very orderly and descriptive fashion, and it's going to convey all the information that Jenny would want to know about birds. If she'll take the time to read it straight through, she will have a clear understanding of what birds are and probably a whole bunch of things that she wouldn't have known to ask about. And you might say, well, why isn't the Bible like that? Well, the short answer is that the Bible is the Word of God that was revealed progressively over time. The Bible is 66 separate books written by dozens of individuals over nearly 1,500 years in multiple languages on three continents. <laughs> it is an incredible tapestry of God communicating through man. It's not easy to understand because there are so many different authors, human authors that is, each one of them has their own style of writing and sometimes they vary styles. And so one of the things that you'll need to understand in interpreting scriptures are the different genres in which the writers communicate. And we'll have a whole lesson just on that one subject. But if you want to understand a subject, let's say the Holy Spirit, and I've had people ask me, Harris, where can I go to read? What chapter can I read that's going to tell me all about the Holy Spirit? There is no one place you can go that's going to give you a comprehensive discussion of who the Holy Spirit is and his role in your life. Yes, there are individual scriptures that I could quote you, but there really isn't a book that is devoted to understanding the person of the Holy Spirit. You have to go through 
the totality of Scripture to piece together all of the different references into one comprehensive doctrine of who the Holy Spirit is. That takes a lot of effort. And for those purposes, you're probably going to read a book or listen to a video. But when you're searching the scriptures yourself, and let's say you're reading through the Bible, you're going to find that it's incredibly different in the way information is conveyed. The first part of the Bible is historical. Then it switches to legal. Then after that, it becomes historical. Then um, you have a, a prophetic, you've got poetic, all these different types of styles of writing and a tremendous volume of information, 2,000 pages. It's no wonder that people can be daunted and say, well, this is just too difficult for me. Only that's not true. It is not too difficult for you. It requires real effort. But if we go back to the, the verse that we looked at just a moment ago from Joshua, consider what Joshua is told as the leader of a nation. Think of all the responsibilities he had. And what does God say? This book of the law, which is the five books of Moses or the Torah, shall not depart from your mouth. In other words, everything that you do is to be influenced by this. If God would expect that of the leader of a nation, what excuse do we have for not putting in the effort to acquire the knowledge of what God says to us? Because the Bible is the only objective source of truth about God in your life. There are many subjective sources. The Bible is the only one that you know to be true. Well, let's switch back to 2 Timothy. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching. Teaching is the communication of truth, the understanding of spirituality, and that encompasses really everything that's in Scripture. So teaching is the way that we learn what Scripture says. Then we come to a word you probably never even used before. Have you ever, think about it, have you ever used the word reproof or reprove? So what does that mean? Well, I'd like to contrast it with the next word, because it's close to this word, but there's an important difference. The third verb is for correction. If someone is saying something, and they're a little off, and perhaps they're taking the position that they think that this verse means one thing, and you say, but wait a second, take a look over here. Have you considered this? What you're doing is you're gently correct them. You're saying, you're a little off course. Come take a look at this and come back to, to true again. Come back to a solid basis for your answer. You're a little bit straying off the course there. That's correction. Reproof is when you are calling something error. So for example, if a person said to me, Harris, I think that scripture makes a stronger case for baptism by sprinkling. I might have a discussion with them as to why I think that water baptism by immersion is more scriptural. But we could have a good-natured discussion about it, and you know, I'm attempting to correct what I think is them being a little bit off of what scripture teaches, but we could have a good back and forth and everything would be fine. Whereas if a person said to me, Harris, you know, I've been reading the Bible and I think I've convinced myself that this Jesus was just a man after all. He isn't God at all. I can't correct that. In other words, I can't adjust that 30 degrees and make it better. That is error. And the only thing that I can do is to identify it as error. And in the nicest possible way, say to them, I think you have missed what scripture teaches on this subject. Why don't you go and read this and then let's talk? Because I can't even have a conversation on the subject of Jesus with someone who holds to the view that he is not God because there's no room for compromise on that. You, you can't believe that Jesus is not God and say that you're a Christian because you're denying the basis of Christianity. So there, there would be a need for 
reproof as opposed to correction. Finally, for training in righteousness. Now, that's not a phrase that you probably use every day either. Training in righteousness simply is being taught how to live. Day by day, how are you supposed to live out your life? That's what the Bible tells you. That's training in righteousness. Now, the next passage that I have set forth here is from uh, the book of Acts, which is a recounting of Paul's, primarily, of Paul's missionary journeys. And in this particular missionary journey, he is coming for, from Thessalonica, where he did not receive a good reception from the Jews when he taught at their synagogue. And he now tra travels to the uh, synagogue in Berea. Now, here's what verse uh, 11 says from Acts 17. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So let me set the context here. Paul is coming to their city, and he is bringing to them an astonishing message. To you, it might be second nature because you've lived with it all of your lives. But you have to remember, he is the first person to bring the gospel to this place. And they are thunderstruck. They are awed by what he's saying. They don't respond with something subjective, saying, that's not what I expected. So we're going to reject that. Or, I don't think I like that very much. Or, you know, that's not what I was taught. That's not what our rabbi says. No, what did they do? They received the word with eagerness. They, they wanted to hear what Paul was teaching so that they would just blindly accept it. No, so that they could examine the scriptures daily to test the truth, the accuracy, the veracity of this new message. It was a radical message, a whole new covenant, a new covenant in Jesus's blood. And they said, this is potentially wonderful news, but we can't just take your word on this. We have to search the scriptures to see if it is so. And God reserves his greatest praise for this group of people. There's a word here that you won't see used this way in the New Testament except here. It was the only time in the New Testament that a group of people were referred to as noble. Now, these Jews were more noble. What was noble about them? Their character. Because they were people who would choose, when confronted with new information, not to respond out of their personality, out of their background, out of what was comfortable or familiar. But they said, let us test this. Let us see if the scripture can confirm what you're saying. Only then will we believe. And God says of these people, they are of noble character. And the time I can think of in the Old Testament that someone is referred to as of noble character is the Proverbs 31 woman, who is not, to my knowledge, an actual person, but an idealized woman, the perfect woman, who does all these things so well. Well, here these aren't idealized churchgoers. These are real people, and God says of them, now these people are of noble character because they respond to something new by testing it against my word. So this is an encouragement to us in our acceptance of new things, of understanding God and every other doctrine in Christianity. Be like the Bereans, because that's who God says we should emulate. Now, when you are going to look through Scripture, there are two possible approaches, and I'm going to share them with you now. I'm going to give you the technical term, the theological terms. I don't care whether you use the theological terms or not. It really doesn't matter to me, but I'm going to give them to you just so that you're aware of them. The first term is exegesis. Exegesis is the interpretation of a text based on 
a careful, objective analysis. The word exegesis literally means to lead out of. The reader is led to his conclusions by following the text. In other words, you are going to see what's in the scripture independent of your own personal opinion, your own subjective bias. You're going to just allow what's in that scripture to be brought out into you so that you are changed, which is the opposite of eisegesis. Eisegesis is the interpretation of a text based on a subjective, non-analytical reading. The word eisegesis literally means to lead into. The reader injects his own ideas into the text, making it mean whatever he wants it to. So eisegesis is where you come to Scripture with a predetermined attitude or belief, and you seek to put that belief into the Scripture dictating an outcome, as opposed to objectively assessing what the Scripture says and allowing that Scripture to inform your view. So there are two opposite approaches. Obviously, the one that we're going to practice here in our group is going to be exegesis. Imagine I said to you, I, I'm just so you know, I am a Giants fan, uh, New York Giants football. And I'm disgusted by the season that we had. And I've decided that I am going to try out to be the quarterback for the New York Giants next season. Because I think I can do a better job than the people they have playing right now. And you try to reason with me. And you say, Harris, that makes no sense on so many levels. Well, I say, no, 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 you're, you're not being scriptural. I can prove to you that I can do this. And you say, huh? How could you possibly prove that you can do it? Yes, I'll give you this. I'll give you the chapter and verse to support what I'm going to be doing. Philippians 4.13, which says that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And you say, hmm, that is... Philippians 4.13. It does say all things. What you're trying to do is a thing. Hmm. This is perplexing. What you're saying, Harris, that you should try out for the New York Football Giants quarterback position next year, it seems to be supported by Scripture. Now, this would be a terrible form of eisegesis. You know there's error here. Let me help you to see what the error is. One of the cardinal rules of exegesis is that you are going to be looking at the verse in context. So let's actually pull up Philippians 4.13, but we're now we're going to look at it in the context in which it appears. And Paul is in prison as he writes this. He's endured terrible hardship. And he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. Now, is Paul saying here that he can do literally all things in the universe? Can he create a new race of human beings? That would be a thing to do that, wouldn't it? Of course, Paul is not saying that. And in looking at the context in which Paul says all things, you have to go back to the preceding verses to see what he's talking about. He's saying, I've lived in the full spectrum of circumstance. I know how to abound, and I know what it's like to be abased. I've seen the highs, I've seen the lows. 
I can endure anything that this life throws in me, at me because I can do it through him who strengthens me. That's clearly the context in which Paul is uttering these words. But if all you do is quote Philippians 4.13 in isolation, it can so easily lead to eisegesis, where a person could put in whatever they want. I can do all things. You can put in your own all things. What would you want your all things to be? Clearly, if it's outside of God's will, God's not going to bless that. And it would be an abuse of Paul's words here to try to make it into something other than what he's saying, which is that I can go through whatever God requires me to go through because he will give me the strength to do it. So that's a real-life example of eisegesis versus exegesis. And we're going to go into this a lot more next time. For so many people, this is going to be eye-opening. Because think about it. All your life you've been told, read the Bible. And you know you're supposed to read the Bible. But if in reading it, you're not understanding what you're reading, is that really so very valuable? Yes, it is better to read the Bible than not to read the Bible. That is an absolutely true statement. But how much better is it to read with comprehension? I'm going to be teaching you the principles that you can use when you're alone, just reading the Bible, just you and God, to make better sense of Scripture. And the danger, if you don't have this, is that you're going to encounter something which makes no sense. You might read this Philippians 4.13. You might see those words, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And you might think, huh. What a, what a ridiculous thing that is. You know, how can I believe in this Christianity when they make, you know, clearly illogical platitudes like that? Well, it's not a clearly illogical platitude if you understand what Paul is saying. And so you need to have the rules for interpreting the words that you're reading for them to make sense. And once you have these rules, you're going to go back and read the scriptures that you've read perhaps for many years and you're going to say, huh, I never saw that before. I've never done this before. This changes the way I view this passage that I've known my whole life. And that's the exciting thing about Scripture is that you can have a passage or even a, a passage that you've memorized verbatim. And then you can learn some new concept and it will change the meaning that you have been absolutely sure of your entire life. Because scripture is absolutely true, but our understanding of it is constantly needing to be improved. And that's what these principles can tell you. In order for you to be able to practice Christianity, to be a Christian, you need to understand what this book says and how much better if you can figure it out for yourself. So that's our goal over the course of this series.